All right, so let's uh, finish this, this paper off. Uh, we look at the last 10 questions in this video. So question 21. During one year, the national output of a country valued in terms of money prices increased by 8%, while the index of prices of goods and services produced in the country increased by 3%. So 3% is basically your inflation rate. And uh, no, they want to you to calculate your real national output. No, that will always be less than the nominal one because you have to take inflation rate into account. You do so by subtracting. You get five. Pretty simple. Let's move on. Now, the table shows the CPI rate of inflation in the United States from 2006 to 2013. This brings about a very common misconception where people at times think that going from this is like deflation, going like this is a decrease in price. That isn't true. As long as your rate of inflation is positive, that means prices are still increasing. Now, the rate at which they increase might vary depending on uh, the percentage. So 4.1 might mean prices are increasing at faster than they will in the next year. Uh, that is 0 0.1 in 2008. However, even if the inflation rate decreases, prices still continue to increase. They just increase at a decreasing rate. Prices will only decrease when you have a negative sign. So what can be concluded from the figures about the period uh, 2006 to 2013? There was one year of constant prices. No, there wasn't. You need 0% inflation for that. There were three years of deflation. There weren't any years of deflation because you didn't see any negative inflation rates. Uh, and you can cross out C as well because there were eight years of inflation because every single year had some positive inflation rate, which means prices were increasing. So there weren't only four, which gives you D because if there were eight years of inflation, that means eight years of increasing prices. That means eight years of increasing living costs. Now, in 2014, Australia and China negotiated a trade agreement. This removed Chinese tariffs on 95% of Australian exports in exchange for greater access to the Australian economy for Chinese investors. How is this uh, expected to affect the Australian balance of payments in the short run? Now, if you think about it, if you remove a tariff, it becomes easier for Australian products to sell inside China, which is basically Australian exports. So if export revenue of Australia increases, obviously China is going to be paying Australia. Uh, you know, it's going to be paying Australia for the exports. Uh, and because of that, because China is buying Australian exports, right? And, and more Chinese will buy these, these exports because the tariff is gone. So it's easier for that trade to happen. Uh, so obviously there are more more of them buying the exports or more chinese buying australian exports so more payment going from china to australia which is like an inflow obviously this goes in your current account that's where your balance of trade is um don't try be confused and try to link this with elasticities uh, you can't do so if they haven't given you information about the elasticity of the of australia or china's imports or exports whoops Anyhow, financial account. Uh, so it's easier for Chinese investors to invest in Australia because there's greater access. So in the short run, this would mean a greater inflow because Chinese investors keep their money now in Australia. <coughs> in the long run, this might mean outflows of dividends or outflows of interest or profit. But in the short run, it just means an inflow. Turkey can produce a good, but also import some of the good from Egypt. The Turkish currency depreciates against the Egyptian currency. Now, if the Turkish currency depreciates against the Egyptian currency, it's more difficult to buy Egyptian products because it, they're more expensive because uh, you have to pay, uh, you know, in that particular Egyptian currency. So it's more difficult to convert. It's more expensive to convert, and it's of health, hence it's also more expensive to convert and import. Uh, since import prices have gone up effectively then because of the depreciation, it's just way, way more sensible to, uh, to consume and uh, to consume locally produced products, which means 
to match that consumption production will increase in Turkey. And obviously, since now you're importing less from Egypt, you're like, no, no, it's just too expensive to import because of the, because of the depreciation. Since you're not, not importing as much from Egypt, uh, Egypt would need to produce less because, well, obviously people aren't buying from it. Why would it continue to produce the same amount? So production would decrease in Egypt. That, there you go. The table shows the terms of trade for Saudi Arabia. Uh, now, if you remember terms of trade, they were basically your export prices upon import prices in 200. So what these are showing, these are showing that this is showing that terms of trade increased, which means that either export prices increased or import prices decreased or export prices in, uh, increased, import prices also increased, but export prices increased by more. So those are the options. What can be concluded from the table for Saudi Arabia? A, export prices rose relative to import prices. Yeah, basically they rose more or they rose relative to import prices. Uh, I'm just feeling lazy, so I'm not going to go through the other options. They're just clearly wrong anyways. Um, 26. What is present in a customs union but not in a free trade area? So you can clearly cancel this stuff out because common monetary system, common system of taxation, all of that type of stuff is not present in a customs union. A customs union isn't that extreme form of unification. What a customs union normally does have is a common external tariff. So it could be A, definitely. In fact, uh, let's look at D. The free movement of all goods, services, and factors of production. Now, this makes life a little problematic. Uh, in fact, this is a nice MCQ because of that. Because the free movement of goods and services that is present in both customs union and free trade area, the free movement of factors of production Usually, usually you don't include that in a free trade area. Free trade area normally just means goods and services. But the thing here is like A is completely correct. In D, I mean half of it's fine, but the I mean half of it is it is wrong because goods and services are uh, you know are are moved freely in both these uh, forms of unification. However. Uh, factors of production will definitely move in a customs union. And I, I, I guess there may be cases where they do also move in a free trade area, not usually though. However, with A, it is always, you can never have a common external tariff in a free trade area. That just doesn't happen. And you always have a common external tariff in the textbook definition of a customs union, which is why you stick with A, even though D might not completely be wrong. 27, which argument in favor of protectionism is not generally regarded as economically valid? So A states that it, it, it increases the standard of living of the population in general, which is just wrong because like uh, if, you, if the, you are, you're protecting, if you're having protectionist policies, then what's happening is your, your uh, people have less choice uh, so there's less consumer sovereignty. Uh, they obviously would have to suffer from higher, highly higher prices for domestic products because of slack and so on. They can't simply buy cheaper imports. So standard of living goes down. It doesn't go up. Um, and in fact, if you look at a lot of uh, countries with high standards of living, though a lot of them have deficits of their balance of trade because high standard of living norm of living normally correlates with uh, you know, importing a lot of stuff, having that, um, having such choice and variety. Anyhow, B, it prevents heavily subsidized imports from competing unfairly against domestic goods. So kind of like a case of dumping, basically, to simplify it. And yeah, uh, our protectionism does do that. Uh, in fact, sorry, why did I cross this? A is your answer, but I'm just going through the other one. Because A, a is something that is not valid, but B is, is definitely a valid uh, argument. C, it provides time for the protected industries workers to be retrained for other work. Definitely uh, uh, an argument, a valid argument. D, once the protected industry becomes established, it will produce efficiently. Also like the, your sunrise industry argument. 28, 
which action is classified as a fiscal policy measure. So fiscal policy is normally looking at the budget, looking at expenditure, looking at taxes, stuff of that sort. Uh, it's obviously not looking at your currency because that's monetary. Uh, so that's your exchange rate, that's just monetary. Uh, managing changes in the level of government debt could be it because government debt is basically borrowing, right? Uh, you're looking at borrowing and how much they owe and all of that. So if, if government debt uh, is basically a lot of the times it's created by government expenditure and then looking at how you borrow to finance that debt is kind of like looking at how you borrow to finance that expenditure. So wherever you have that expenditure link going on, it's obviously going to be a fiscal measure because government expenditure is just a textbook tool of your fiscal policy. Providing guidance to industry and the public. Well, uh, no, uh, that's nowhere uh, listed as a fiscal policy measure. Uh, and again, for financial institutions might be a supply side policy, but not necessarily a fiscal policy. A country has a deficit on the current account of the balance of payments. Which policy would be expected to increase the deficit? A, an appreciation of the exchange rate. So now this is a little confusing though, because appreciation of the exchange rate would definitely increase the deficit, which by increasing the deficit, we mean, we mean you know, uh, lead to more deficit in a way or a, or a greater deficit, make things worse. So normally appreciation does make things worse because normally if you're exporting, your, your, your elasticity is, is likely to be uh, high. It's likely to be elastic because again, you're exporting into the international market, right? So if it is elastic, then appreciation doesn't help at all. However, if it's inelastic, then appreciation might help. Um, and we're looking for cases where it doesn't help. So I'll just leave that for now. Let's look at the other ones. Uh, if you increase domestic productivity, well, that will just help you sell better and cheaper exports. So that, that helps you. You're, you're supposed to look, look at something that increases the deficit. Yeah, that not, that's not something that decreases it. Um, C, if you have protectionist policies like import quotas that reduces imports and import expenditure, so that also decreases the deficit. Uh, if you give subsidies to domestic firms, uh, that again helps you sell cheaper exports, so export revenue rises, and again uh, the deficit would simply decrease; it wouldn't increase. Uh, this, this is this, uh, this by the way is illegal, uh, but I don't think the CIA cares that much about uh, international law. Anyhow, so that will leave you with A, and that's likely. Like if you appreciate your exchange rate, your then your export prices go up and it become, they become less competitive and all of that type of stuff. And that just leads to your balance of trade moving even more towards a deficit. Your current account moving even more towards a deficit. Um, again, A could be wrong in the case where your, your, your products, exports and imports were highly inelastic, but the other three are definitely wrong. So, like, so, so even if A isn't completely right, because the other three are definitely wrong, you can just go ahead with A anyways. 30, which type of policy would have the most immediate effect in dealing with a deflationary economic downturn? So you're looking to stimulate the uh, economy to get it out of deflation. So you want to increase aggregate demand and you want the most immediate effect. Um, remember budgeting for a deficit is expansionary. However, budgeting for a surplus is just contractionary. So that will just further uh, increase deflation. It won't decrease it. Increasing liquidity by assisting banks to lend more. So what happens when they lend more? When they lend more, uh, you know, investment expenditure should go up uh, because what do you say? Because it's just easier for firms to, you know, take, to take out loans and like, uh, um, and invest and so on. Uh, but this normally is like not very useful because it doesn't have a very immediate effect. However, for large you know, um, expenditures, consumption also goes up. Like imagine you want to buy that car and you get the liquidity, you get banks to lend you, uh, they're lending more, you're getting loans easily. So obviously consumption expenditure will also go up. And that is, has a, a very quick and direct link with aggregate demand. Investment will take its time. So it won't be the most immediate effect, but consumption will. So I believe consumption can have a pretty quick effect. C. 
investing in projects to improve transport networks. Now again, investments will increase aggregate demand, but in their own sweet time. So we can kind of cross this out. D, switching the burden of taxation from earning to spending. So you're kind of going from a direct, excuse the handwriting, you're kind of going from a direct tax, like an income tax to an indirect tax. But the idea here is there's still tax, right? So like, I don't see how consumption here will be encouraged because I mean, initially before you were just taxing it out of their income. Now you're just taxing it when they go out to spend. So they still would be equally discouraged to, from spending. The, the, the consumption would probably more or less remain the same because the tax rate, the, maybe, maybe the means of collection of tax has changed, but the tax rate itself is more or less the same. So uh, you can cross this out. Now let me just quickly check um, my answers to see if I got any wrong. All right, so we're good for now. Uh, all our answers were marked correctly and that concludes this paper, this video and this paper. If you liked it, do spread it around. Uh, don't keep it to yourself. And if you want, if you want me to solve any particular uh, MCQ paper, just let me know in the comments below. And that's it from my end.